Good morning, Compass. Good time in worship. Let's give it up for our band leading us in worship. Worship is one of those things that is supposed to be fundamental to the Christian, a non-negotiable, inseparable from my identity. David puts it this way, I will bless the Lord when? At all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Paul puts it this way. He says, in all things, give thanks. Regardless of what it looks like, I am reminded what? He loves us. He loves us. And when I look at life through the lens of his word, then when things are not going, Janelle, the way I want them to go, I accept all things are working together for good. To them that love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose and contrary to what the enemy would like, he would like to silence my worship. He would like to stop me from giving thanks because I'm sick or because I can't pay every bill. Like Job, he comes with the accusation, Frank don't really love you. Frank looks like he loves you because he's on the payroll. Everything's going Frank's way. Change that and see what Frank do. And God is saying they're going to keep on worshiping me. Amen? Oh, how he loves us. We, uh, we're in a series, Missional Living. And I would ask that you would turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Acts chapter 4. Before we go there, just looking at some statistics online 60% of people tell this lie, I'm fine. When they're not fine, when things are not going well. It's not true. It is a falsehood. 40% tell this lie, I will be there in five minutes. Raise your hand. <laughs> Raise your hand. I'll be there in five minutes. 40% tell this lie. 35%, I'm on my way. And you lying. Why are you lying? You just woke up. You're still in the house. No makeup on. Why are you lying? You're not on your way. 30%. Here it is. I didn't see your message. Let's be real. You saw it. <laughs> and the Lord know you saw it. You didn't want to respond. And then you lie. You say something that is not the truth. Here's what we all do. Except maybe my wife. My wife is different in this regard. Here's this one. I have read and agreed to the terms and conditions. <laughs> now, when my wife and I, we first got married, we're laying in the bed. I'm reading a commentary. She reads the terms and conditions on like credit card things. That's what she likes to read. I'm like, who does that? Lies that we tell. Common types of lies to protect feelings. We do it. Personal gain through self-promotion. Years ago, I asked my wife, we were getting ready for church. I said, babe, do I look good? Now, Jack Nicholson said, some people can't handle the truth. And my wife turned to me and she said, not in those pants. And I thought, what do the pants, what do the pants have to do with anything? But then what I reflected on, Mike, my wife does not lie. I said, okay. You know, if I wasn't prepared for what she was going to say, personal gain through self-promotion, 64% Lie for personal gain through self-promotion. All kinds of reasons why we lie. We're going to look at that today with some encouragement to be people who speak the truth. I don't know if we're able to get what's on my screen up on these screens above. If, if that's not the case, that's okay. I would ask you to turn with me to Acts. There we go. 
Turn with me to Acts chapter 4. Now it was in the previous installment that the apostles who had healed a person had been on trial. And after being on trial, they were threatened. And they said, you will not go out into the temple preaching this resurrection in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And then they went back to their brethren, having received that threat, Robert. They went back to their brethren. And by this, I am admonished that when I'm threatened, when things are getting difficult, take the lead of people who were mentored by Jesus. In fact, take the lead of Jesus. When he's in a downtime, he retreats to be with his people. And they go back to be with their brethren. They shared what had happened and they prayed. Y'all remember what happened when they prayed? Anybody remember? What happened? Building shook, right? We're going to look at that here in just a moment. This is after that. The building shook and then it says they went out and they prayed with boldness. We're in verse 32. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of land or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each one as anyone had need. We are first introduced to the character of the kingdom. When we think of the kingdom of God coming, many of us are under the impression that when Jesus comes again, second time, when Jesus comes again, that's when the kingdom of God comes. Actually, the kingdom of God comes when His people are present, operating under His sovereignty Respecting his policies. The kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And when that happens, the kingdom of God has come. And what we're looking at here initially is that the kingdom of God had actually already come. Not the fullness, there is more to come. But aspects of the kingdom had already showed up. How did they show up? They showed up in attitude. First of all, they were unified. People who normally can't get along, now it says they have one heart and one soul. When we talk about the soul, you're talking about self. In fact, the word soul means self more than the word self means self. S-O-S, it means save our, not selves, soul. When we talk about the number of people on board a ship, an airliner, a cruise ship, we talk about the number, not of selves on board, we talk about the number of what? Souls. If I'm a little bit archaic in my language, I realize that the word soul is a better way of describing the whole person. There were no factions, there were no divisions, Lisa. They were effectively one person. What? The kingdom had come. One evidence, Blanca, of the anointing is unity. That's just evidence of the anointing. When I am being led by the anointing, because the anointing, Dana, is not divided. There is not a division in Christ or the mind of Christ. He doesn't flip-flop. He doesn't go back and forth. And if you're operating under the leading of the Spirit, and I'm operating under the leading of the Spirit, then anything that would cause us to be divided parties, anything that would cause us to be divided, denominationalism, anything that would cause us to be divided, ethnic alliances, I will actually set that aside because I'm being led by the Spirit. Is that making sense? It's an outworking of the anointing. Another outworking of the anointing is generosity. But with regard to that anointing, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my. And forget not all of his benefits. The soul represents the whole person. The soul and all that is within me. To say that the early church had one soul, regardless of how many things were in there, Jenny, for all practical purposes, it's one. 
Does that make sense? One sign of the anointing was the unity. Another sign of the anointing was the generosity. Jesus says this, a new commandment I give to you, that you kind of like one another. That's not what he says. <laughs> a new commandment that I give to you, that when it is convenient, and as long as it is not causing you to draw upon your resources in a way that make it questionable whether or not you're going to be able to get your stuff done, then help one another out. That's my commandment. That's not his commandment. That's not his example. His example is he bankrupts himself. He lays down his life so that we could live, right? A new commandment I give to you. Love one another. How? As I loved you. I want you to look at the standard of love that you've seen in me. And I want you to have that standard. The prior commandment that you love one another. I want you to love as they love you, as beneath. I want you to love the way I loved. I was led by the Spirit. I was empowered by the Spirit. I couldn't give you this commandment before because you didn't have the Spirit. Now you have my Spirit. And so, in so far as you have been empowered to do more, to whom much is given, what? Much is required. I want you to love like I love. That you also love one another. By this, this is what's going to tell people, they're going to know you're my disciples. How? If you have love for one another. That was the coming of the kingdom seen in the early church. Because it says in Romans, for the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Right? I don't know. I'm hearing what you're saying about all this love and action. And I'm hearing what you're saying about them helping one another. And they had all things in common. You see that? Verse 32. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. Is that really indicative of God's work? It really is. And here's the reason why. 1 John 3.11 for this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Why did he give that commandment? Let's keep reading. 1 John 3, 14. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. He actually remains in it. That is actually his residence. When I start loving you in a way that is not always good for me, when I start laying down my life, it is evidence that I am no longer operating as a mere mortal. There has been a washing of regeneration and a renewing of the Holy Spirit, and I have begun to conduct myself no longer as an incredibly humble and handsome young black man. Not merely that. You begin to see Christ in me. Paul said, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. 1 John 3, 16 through 18. By this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. That's the standard. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. I can't say that I am following Jesus who loves Dana and died for Dana if Dana is not somebody that I'm willing to love. That's a contradiction. How can you be following Jesus? Jesus loves Dana and you won't love Dana. And you've rationalized it because of the way she votes. You rationalized it based on her position on some issue. And that's why I'm unkind to her. And that's why it is okay for me to blaspheme, to speak evil of her. But the truth is, she's made in the image of God. And I can't say I love God whom I have not seen and I don't love Dana. These are just verses that indicate that that's what is supposed to be happening in the community when the anointing is at work. Boy, I love it. Let us love one another. Why? For love is of God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. 
He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In essence, God is love. God is also holy. He's a consuming fire. He's righteous. But God is love. And to actually know God, to have an intimate relationship with God, and God know me, is to actually have, at some point, my character Hebel begins to change. We begin to be like the people we hang around. These are just a few verses that indicate what's supposed to happen once we come to know Jesus. And that's actually what was happening in the church. I have a little diagram here, because I like to do diagrams. Can't see it there. Hold on. Can y'all see those concentric rings there? So they had prayed for power. And what happened was that God gave to the apostles, it was not everybody. That is a fallacy. Not everybody could do what the apostles were doing. It wasn't until the apostles laid hands on those who had been chosen by the church that there were more people who could do that. And the reason why the apostles can do that, they need to have unusual credibility. There needs to be an unusually strong association between the apostle and God. Does that make sense? And so they have these unusual abilities. Now, those unusual abilities are on the outside. I would see this unusual ability. You heal somebody. You deliver somebody from demonic influence. And what that leads me to do is to then go in and look at the community. Because I saw what that apostle did. So now I'm coming into Compass Church. And I'm like, whoa. Okay, he votes Republican and he votes Democrat. Hmm. That's interesting. And then, hmm. He white. And I think he black. I don't know, his hair is kind of straight, but I think he's black. Now, normally you got to do some legislation to get that to happen. Interesting. I was drawn in, I was attracted to come in and look at Compass because of the unusual display of power. But then after I came in, I was like, she's like Welsh or something, right? And he's Hispanic. Y'all married? Man, what is going on in here? There is a unity that is hard to describe. And then I found out that when their pastor didn't have a car, people, without asking for money, said, man, I got a car. Drive my car. When he was struggling financially, I said, man, here's some money. And I'm looking at this thing, and this is what God had intended all the time. I've come into this community, and then you opportunistically, because, right, we've been reeling them in. That's what happens. The apostles display the power. Now, they're displaying the power, but the apostles can't be the sum of the gospel. You've got to do your part. If they actually visit Compass, if they actually visit the church in Jerusalem, if they actually come in here, what are they going to see? And they find out, man, they got unity. That's that anointing. And then I find out that they are loving one another, Daniel, with this unusual love. It's crazy how much they love one another. And it is through that that now, Ada, opportunistically, she seizes the moment. I'm like, what's going on here? Let me talk with you about... Jesus. Oh, see, I was trying to wrap up, Ken. Did you see that? It was going to be a 12-minute message. It really was. I was trying to finish it, you know. If we realize that the anointing of the Holy Spirit, which gives you unusual abilities in the discharge of your duties at work, in the classroom, and you are to use that moment, you are to use that platform to talk about Jesus. That was the whole point of the anointing. You're going to wait until you have received power so that you can be a witness. That was the reason. It's working. It's actually happening. And what he does then is he goes on to give us an example to be admired and an example to be avoided. 
But if you see those concentric rings on the outside as a display of power. Now what we should not try to do is try to mimic the early church and put on a display of power that is not most appropriate for a helotus. There is a miracle. There is a display of power that makes the most sense for our community. Amen? Let God lead us in a way that would ask, cause someone to say, yeah, Austin, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go check it out. That's going to make someone say to Aubrey, yes, I do know your name. I'm going to go in to this fellowship. I'm going to go check it out. And then when they get here, they find out that we're not quibbling, squabbling over things that eternally, they don't matter. And when we argue like they do matter, we're behaving like mere mortals. But when we love each other, independent of the differences, Castro, we are behaving. Is that making sense? Like we're born from above. That's what was happening. And then he says, let me give you a particular example. And the and amplifies what was just read. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus. Here's what he did. He had land, he sold it, and he brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. I have to look at the previous verse, 35, 34, and 35. It was in 34. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked. For all who were possessors of land or houses, they sold them, and they brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and they laid them at the apostles' feet, and they distributed to each one as anyone had need. That's what's happening in this community. And then he says, Luke says in his account, let me give you a particular example. Is that making sense? Let me give you an actual name of someone spirit-led who's actually doing this, and Joseph who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement. He was just an encouraging brother. He saw Saul, who had become Paul, who had persecuted the church and tried to destroy it. And instead of rejecting him, Jolene, he accepted him and he commended people. Can we look at people through the lens of the gospel? That was just an encouraging brother. John Mark had abandoned a missionary journey. And Alex, we said, we ain't taking that brother on another missionary journey. We're not taking him. Barnabas said, I will. It's amazing how we look at the sins of other people through a microscope, but we look at our own sin through a telescope. I don't know. I did a sin. I mean, back in 1970, I think I was wrong once. I was actually right, but I thought I was wrong, and that's why. But when you make a mistake, right? I hang on to it. In fact, if you lose your fault, I will find it for you. Bring it to you. Dust it off. Yeah, you did that. I just, here, I made it a sticker so I could put it on you. But this brother of encouragement says, I am not going to participate in the acts of Satan, who is the accuser of the brethren. And since God has removed my sin from me, as far as the east is from the west, I'm not bringing it up again. Amen? Amen. Not bringing it up. And he would just encourage people. He's a Levite of the country of Cyprus, which is an island just off of Antioch. He had land, he sold it, and he is doing, here's a particular example of what was mentioned earlier. He sold the land, he took the money, and then he did what we do. We come and we give our offering, and then we tell you how to use it. I want 35% of my offering, which was a dollar, to go to the children's ministry, and I want 20% to go, and then I want 10%. This is the way it's supposed to happen. He said, but what if the ministry misuses? Do you know God's going to hold them accountable, right? He's going to hold them accountable. Do your part and don't try, to, don't try to micromanage what you give, right? Ultimately, I have to regard people not after the flesh. I have to regard my leadership not after the flesh. They're not perfect, but I have to trust that insofar as they're willing, God is operating through them and he has enabled them, whether they choose to or not, but to manage what I have given with a wisdom that comes from God. Amen? Amen. And if they don't do that, God's going to hold them accountable because they had the opportunity to do that. And that's what he did. He sold his property in Halotus. I'm just using that as an example. 
And he had the money for it, $250,000. And then he came and he said, do what's needed for my accomplished church. Amen? That was a particular example. I see that there are needs in my church. Do what's needed for my church. That's what he did. An example to be admired. The end of verse 36 actually amplifies what was mentioned earlier. Well, then we get another example. We get the example of, An yeah, of Ananias and Sapphira. After we get the example of Barnabas. So let's look at that for just a moment. Acts chapter 5 verse 1. But, see how it's a contrast? It was after the first example that we said and. Further, Joel, let me give you a particular example. And, right? And there was this guy named Barnabas that allows me to further prove that the anointing of that congregation wasn't a general idea, but it was actually working itself out in the lives of people. Fallen, broken people were endeavoring to honor God and live in the power of the Holy Spirit. Taking their stuff, giving in a way that was sacrificial. And then you got but. The but antagonizes. The but is against the prior example. The brother had a cool name too, Barnabas, son of encouragement. They gave you a nickname today based on your character. What would it be? Now, hear what I'm saying? Somebody said, I'm going to give you a nickname today. I mean, I know mine would be the most humble man alive. I don't know what yours would be. But what would it be? This man under the influence of the Holy Spirit was nicknamed Son of Encouragement. Peter was given a nickname. He was given a nickname before it actually came to pass, when he was still wishy-washy, when he was still on and off, when he is still driven by how he feels by the moment he was given the name Rock. Because one day you're going to be a rock. You're going to be solid. Not today. But eventually you're going to be rock solid. Amen? Amen? But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Oh, there was another guy. He sold a possession. But remember, the leading word here is but. So no matter what you said prior, when I say however or nevertheless, or when I say yet or notwithstanding, or I say but, what I'm about to say is in contrast, it negates what happened earlier. Is that making sense? I, I gave you a good example. Let me give you another example. But a certain man named Ananias and Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds. His wife also being aware of it. So they sold it, but then they took some of it out. They sold it, and they took a portion away from the proceeds that came from the sale. Just imagine that. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. No sin in doing that, actually. There's no sin in that. The text is not trying to commend communism. Communism is an ungodly overreach to manage my personal things that have been given to me for the, for the good of all. Well, without my permission and without me wanting to. God is not advocating communism. God loves what kind of giver? You cut five minutes off right there, right there. He loves a cheerful giver. If you are giving a dollar and you don't want to give it, you should have kept that dollar. He didn't want it. The giving needs to be worship because I am forgiven. <laughs> and it's the least that I can do is to give out of my substance to give out of my talent, to give out of my time, right? If you don't want to give, don't give it. Here you have a couple, they're giving and they decide to keep a portion back. There's nothing wrong with that. There's no sin in that. But there is a sin about to take place. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit 
and keep back part of the land for yourself. While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. He had given the impression that he did what Barnabas did. He had given the impression that he was generous like Barnabas was. I want a nickname. I want to be esteemed that way. I want that kind of recognition even if I didn't earn it. That's lying. That's deception. I want you to regard me the way you regard Barnabas who sold it and he gave the whole thing. I want to be equated with that kind of work. What kind of work is that? Let me show you what kind of work that was. When Barnabas did what Barnabas did, because he's like, I don't know if I could do that right. I mean, that good for Barnabas. This is what it says concerning Barnabas. Can you read it, Dana? Can you see that from where you are? No? Can you read that from where you are? You got it, you got it Ken? Yeah. Read it real loud. Verse 24. Barnabas is a spirit-led man. When Barnabas talks, it's the Spirit of God speaking through him. When Barnabas makes a decision, he's being led by the Spirit. Barnabas' generosity is an outworking of the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter 5, verse 5, it says, And the love of God was poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. You should not write yourself off as incapable of giving like Barnabas, but you are able to give like Barnabas because you have the same Spirit as Barnabas. Amen. And that's a choice you can make. You don't have to give like that, but you have that capacity. In the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we have people who have amazing abilities. We call them mutants. Sometimes they have wings. Sometimes they can teleport. God has made us, in comparison to normal humanity, mutants. Your ability to love sacrificially is entirely abnormal. And you have that capacity. And why do you have that capacity? God wants to make you peculiar. He wants to make you unusual. He wants to make you strange. And then when they ask you, Joseph, man, what is wrong with you? Why are you doing that? You're supposed to say one word. Jesus. That's it. It's for witnessing. It's for witnessing. Don't try to get them to manage their time like you. There's no salvation in that. Don't try to get them to go to school where you went to school. Don't try to get them to manage your money like you. That's not ultimately going to be the most help. All the real help is in them putting their faith in Jesus. Amen? Amen. And that's why God gives us the witness. But these people decided... They just wanted the acclaim. They just wanted the applause. They just wanted the approval. They just wanted to be known as great giving people. And they were lying. When the person who is performing all of these miracles, all of these astounding works that nobody else can do, is doing it in the power of the Holy Spirit, why in the world were you not afraid to lie to a person, Robert, they have unusual insight, right? Why does Peter know what happened? Because of the Holy Spirit. It's a serious mistake when we come into the fellowship of believers to be disregarding of the spiritual nature of the anointing of God in this place. You could be talking to somebody and not realize that the Spirit of God is simulta simultaneously telling them, you lying. He so said, how, how in the world would you do that? And here's the reason why he did it. Here's the reason why he did it. Satan had put it in his heart. Like Satan is trying to put something in your heart all the time. Satan is trying to put something in your mind all the time. And that's why you need to have your spiritual handcuffs and we need to take every thought captive. Take that thought captive. You can sit right there. I'll get with you in a minute. I need to go get some scriptures and find out whether or not you're supposed to be here. Take every thought captive. The things in my heart. All kinds of things come into my heart. All kinds of things. Is it just me? Truths of thoughts, all kinds of things. That's not the sin. 
It's not the sin that something lurid, something immoral, something hateful came into my mind or my heart. The sin is when I made it comfortable. When that thought comes into my mind, come here, Caleb. I'm just going to pretend you're a bad thought. Just, I'm sorry, brother. I'm here. <laughs> Now, what I should have done is I should have turned his brother around and I should have locked him up and I said, sit down right there and I'm going to find out whether you're supposed to be here. And if you're not supposed to be here, I'm getting rid of you, right? But instead, what we do, where is that? I said, man, are you comfortable here? Look, I hate you. Are you thirsty? Man, turn around, sit down, sit down, sit down. And I'm trying to find out how to get this thought that I shouldn't be thinking to stay. And I start building on it. And then eventually it becomes a part of my heart. And what was formerly an intrusive thought, and it was entirely unreasonable. Entirely unreasonable. Right, you should go out there and key dance car. And I'm not going to do that. I wonder what it would look like. Because if I key it from my height, he's not going to see it. I mean, I shouldn't do that. Well, you know, depends on what kind of key I used. And I keep ruminating on something, right, that I should have gotten rid of. I should be meditating on the Word of God. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, if there's anything praiseworthy, what does the Bible say? Meditate on these things. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and do not be conformed to this world, right? Satan is bringing those intrusive thoughts, but what I am doing is I am renewing my mind. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. And then eventually, I've got these great godly thoughts, and I'm actually having trouble believing that they're my thoughts, Wait, you want to you wanna take some of our money and go help this person and then you don't even want to tell anybody that we're doing it so that all the glory goes to God and nobody's going to say how great I am? What kind of thought is that? I get these godly thoughts that when I'm thinking about surfing immorality on my phone at night, instead I tell my wife and say, look, I am thinking about doing something ungodly and I don't want that lack of integrity. I'm handing you my phone. I'm locking it, but I'm handing it to you. Man, where did that thought come from? Is that making sense? And that kind of thinking is what happens because of a transformation. It's not immediate. I'm not immediately going to think like that. I'm not going to give you this because it belongs to him. You can go back over there. <laughs> Take every thought captive. Satan was bringing things in, but at some point, because of a decision that we all make, instead of rejecting it, he entertained it. He made it comfortable. And then eventually, it was no longer Satan's thought. It was his thought. Is that making sense? Don't judge Ananias and Sapphira. The failure is not to see the Ananias and Sapphira in us. Is that making sense? And God loves us too much. Oh, how he loves us. Oh, how he loves us. He loves us too much to leave us without an understanding of how this happened. That's what happened with Judas. Satan entered his heart. How? Because he gave place, as it says in Ephesians, he gave a place to the devil. He made a place in his heart for the devil by the choices he made about what he thought about. So, now we have this man, he's lied. Verse 5, then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last. So great fear came upon all those who heard these things. You know, sometimes the difference between the person who got incarcerated and the other person is just one got caught. Let's be honest. They just got caught. You just didn't get caught. That guy got a ticket. You were actually going faster. He got caught so that you wouldn't. God is chastening so that he can admonish the whole body of Christ. God is showing us this so that we would realize 
I really don't want this in this new creation, this new community that I've created. But Rod, if I tell the truth, they might reject me. If you tell the truth and they realize who you really are and they reject you, you weren't friends anyway. Right? If the friendship is based on falsehood, it's not friendship. You can't say that that person is really your friend until they know who you really are. Right? Two forms of lying that need to stop. Active lying, deceptive statements, passive lying. You know, I'm just certain things I'm just not telling you. They both need to stop. Oh, man. But if I tell the truth, if I bring that out, it might be over. You know, as long as the wound is under that Band-Aid, it's not going to heal. Some wounds, they heal best in the sunlight. Is that making sense? And you don't want to rip it off. It's got hair in it and all kinds of things. That's the thing about a lie. You're covering things up and it gets all nasty. And you get hair in it and you rip that. Th- oh! Rip it off. And that's going to hurt. But I promise you this. When we start operating in truth, one of the things we stop living with, what are the secrets that actually make us sick? We stop living with secrets. It becomes a healthy community when there's nothing anybody can bring to the light. (laughs) When there's nothing you're going to say that is going to suddenly cause people to be dismissive of me. Hey, Hubble, I want to tell you. Look, man, here's something you didn't know about Pastor Rod. Did you know that Pastor Rod bought an iPhone? And Hubble says, yeah, he told me. He told you? Did you know that Pastor Rod used to struggle with immorality? No! Yeah, he actually, he already told us. And if you decide that you can't be in fellowship with him, whose problem is that? That's your problem. It's not God's problem. God loves him. Oh, how he loves him. Oh, how he loves him. Right? And when I begin to stop having a small view of grace, that I am going to be without friendships or without fellowship or without family, when people know the truth, that's a small view of grace. I have to believe that God is so gracious that if I tell the truth, even if the number of friends that I have is greatly reduced, that's going to be all I need. Amen? Amen. So I'm going to be good with that. It's just going to be me and Alex, man. It's just me and Alex. Nobody else want to talk with me. I said, okay. And then Dan came along, and it's the three amigos. One white guy, one black guy, one Hispanic guy, looking for an Asian guy. (laughs) What? Ananias, he falls down dead. So, consequently, hence, therefore, great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And the young men arose, wrapped him up, carried him out. Buried him, that was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter answered her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. What? This is my biblical imagination, okay? I imagine she had a higher voice. Then Peter said, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Not one of you said, this is a dumb idea. This is a dumb idea. Might come up with an idea and Bridget said, no, nah, you're on your own. Nope, not having anything to do with that. Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door. They just got back. They just finished burying the guy, walked up to the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in and found her dead. And carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon all who heard these things. Why did this happen? This happened, it's a sign. It's a sign in the same way that when you receive Christ, I just want to say I don't smoke. When y'all see this, y'all like, what's going on? What happened when they received the Holy Spirit at the beginning of Acts on the day of Pentecost? You remember what happened? What? Right? Right? That's what happened. And then, you don't have like oil in your hair or nothing like that. And listen, and it didn't happen after that. The sign was an indicator of a spiritual reality that had taken place and he wasn't going to keep doing it. Right? And then, 
when they came back to fellowship with their brethren and they cried out to God, God, give us boldness and give us backing signs, what happened? Y'all remember? Somebody say it. They came back after being threatened. What happened, Kathy? The building shook! Y'all ever watch Star Trek? The bridge is not actually moving, right? They all just lean to one side and then they all just lean to the other side and everybody is convinced that the whole ship shook. But this was real. The building literally shook and it doesn't say that happened again. It was a sign indicating that if you would start, finally start praying with a way that aligns with my agenda, I'm going to shake things up. That's what's happening when two or three people are gathered in my name and you're asking for something that is important to me. Which is you talking about my son. And then there was a sign. So what's going on here with Ananias and Sapphira? It's a sign. Thank you. So what are you saying, Pastor Rod, that if I lie, if I, Pastor Rod, tell you that I am actually a tall Asian man, yeah, I'm probably not going to drop dead. That sign was an indicator of the great displeasure of God that you brought that worldly mess into this fellowship that I created anew, right? And eventually I'm going to deal with the fact that you brought lying into my fellowship. It's a sign. You're not going to drop down dead. Not likely. You could. He could do that. But that's not what he's likely to do in the same way that when you receive Christ, that's not going to happen. It's most likely not going to happen. But what God wants me to do is he wants me to operate by faith. And I believe that what God would have me to do is to start telling the truth. Amen? And I'm not telling the truth out of fear, but I'm telling the truth out of a reverence for God. And I'm telling the truth, not as I am mustering the strength to do it from my flesh. I'm telling the truth in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Lord God, I thank you for this time together. I pray, dear God, that we would admire and accept the example of Barnabas. And that we would be admonished and avoid the example of Ananias and Sapphira. And we would stop lying the lying of deceitful statements and the lying of omission and become the community that you would have us to be, to repent of the sin of being deceptive in order that your spirit is not hindered in using compass to draw people to Jesus. Not to compass, but actually to Jesus. In Jesus' name, we said...